but yeah. took on another inpatient hospital situation. So good. Did it very gracefully, I might add. Yes, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Core Consult RX Podcast, and this is episode 25. 25. So, Quarter of the way to 100. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And it only took us four years. I know. Our baby's growing up so fast. When was our first episode? Do you remember? Um, I think it was late. I think it was like December. Yeah. But then we took like a break. That was our pilot, you know. That was our pilot. That was our pilot. So and Actually, the pilot never actually made it to... No, it didn't. Because we recorded one. It was terrible. You guys should be thankful it didn't make it to the air. <laughs> yeah. So the, the published pilot was in December, and I think we started everything else early 2018. Yeah. So this is our year. This is, this is the... This is the year of the podcast. The year of the podcast. So today, we're going to uh-huh. be talking about acute coronary syndrome. Yes. Um, as well as stable ischemic heart disease. Mm-hmm. Kind of talking about how we can differentiate between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, what they are, if you're not familiar with those terms. Um, and then kind of walk you through a actual emergency event known as a STEMI. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, we'll yeah. see how it goes along the way. And within that, we're kind of focusing on antiplatelets and to play with therapy in general. We've done uh, stroke. I think if you go back to the early days, we did a stroke case and a podcast on stroke. Yep. Uh, we've also done um, VTE. So we've done DVT and PE. So now we're uh, meeting in the middle, going basically head to toe, and we're going <laughs> ACS. Yes. Yes. From hit, from toe to head and back to the heart. <laughs> back to the heart. It's like the circulatory system. Yeah, exactly. Nothing, Perfect. Nothing at all like the circulatory system. You know how it starts in your toes? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yep. So uh yeah, well, um I guess we'll start off talking kind of about some terminology cuz mm-hmm. one of the things you'll hear is the term CAD, so uh coronary uh artery disease in general, and that's talking more of like this initial atherosclerotic plaque buildup um which obviously is going to over time become a problem because it's disrupting the blood flow. Um, not allowing that oxygen-rich blood to flow where it needs to go, and so it can lead to, to issues. So from there, you can kind of separate it out two different ways. For, for, from CAD, you can go down to just where we have stable ischemia, which is you know where we get our angina and just our just generic chest pains that kind of come and go. Maybe right. it's from exercise. So a stable lack of oxygen right. getting to the heart. Exactly. And usually it's from a specific event. So like exercising or, you know, something that makes you real nervous where right. your heart starts pumping faster to where you actually start to realize it. Or right. maybe it just kind of comes and goes uh, randomly, but then right. you can take some meds and it goes away. Because in that instance, own. you're going to have increased demand, but you're not meeting the demand with the oxygen flow. And so it's going to start hurting. Exactly. And then the other side of that is the more emergency side. And so that's where we get acute coronary syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is going to be broken down even further where we have like the uh, un- or, um, unstable angina, mm-hmm. which is where you're having this chest pain, but it's not going away. Right. Um, and also something called an NSTEMI, um, which is where we, when we look at the ECG, we do not see that uh, ST elevation. Um, and so those could kind of get lumped together a lot of times because they're not necessarily as serious, right. so to speak, as the uh, STEMI, which is a myocardial infarction that actually has a ST segment elevation. Yep. So that's some of the terminology. We're going to walk through how we kind of treat those. We're, we're not going to spend a ton of time um, walking yeah. through each one. but We're we definitely are... focusing more on STEMI yeah. and uh, PCI and what to do before and long-term antiplatelet therapy after. Right. So... Okay, so that's some of the, the terminology. Um, before somebody actually has an event, usually they start off with signs of having like angina. Right. Um, where, you know, it kind of comes and goes, like we said. So we're going to have a uh, first line treatment option for someone who actually has um, this stable ischemia is usually a beta blocker. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's several other types of angina, like Prince metals angina. Um, in that case, we would not use a beta blocker, but we're going to save that for another time. So this is just regular, uh, regular angina, first line beta blocker. So you're going to decrease the 
oxygen demand of the heart, mm-hmm. um, decrease some of the contractility, and then you're going to decrease some of that left ventricular wall tension as well. Right. And so it's going to uh, basically delay the onset of the angina or the increase their ischemic threshold, I guess, um, during exercise or whatever else is causing the event in the first place. And different than like congestive heart failure, we don't really have guidance as to which beta blocker to choose, right? Correct, it's yeah. Kind of, if we don't have those three evidence-based beta blockers, it's kind of like anything except for tenolol. So, yeah. <laughs> so we don't like a tenolol. <laughs> we don't like that one. Um, we won't go into that, but if you go back on iTunes and you can see uh, harm with old atenolol. O-L, high comma. Yep. And then, uh, you know, I think the way, if you ha- are having problems picking, like, which one, uh, other than the per- you know patient's preference, uh, I would look at, for instance, if they need further uh, blood pressure lowering, if they're also dealing with hypertension, you can go with carbetalol because mm-hmm. it's an alpha beta blocker. You can get some further blood pressure lowering. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, for instance, if they have uh, their blood pressure under control, you don't want to take it any lower uh, than something like metoprolol, um, you know, one of the others, agents, pisoprolol, that uh, won't have as great of an effect on the blood pressure would be a, a good option. Or if they have like a chronic lung disease, you might want to go with something more selective. And I, I think, I, wasn't there a trial that came out looking at pisoprolol being used in COPD and that might actually be preferred yeah, from that, here on out? Yeah, that trial was looking at uh, patients that had both heart failure and okay, COPD. Okay, so that was heart failure. Okay. Um, and that, of, of the three heart failure meds, so carvedilol, um Metoprolol sucks in and bisoprolol. Bisoprolol had the better gotcha. outcomes. Gotcha. But um, yeah, so same kind of thing as normal. We're starting low with the dose, kind of titrating up slowly. Um, and then we would want to monitor the heart rate uh, and make sure that it's under control. So having a resting heart rate, even as low as 50 to 60 um, in cases of severe angina. And then for exercise, you would want to make sure that the heart rate is less than 75% of whatever that rate is that precipitates the ischemia mm-hmm. is a good way to look at it. So I guess above 75%, they consider that high intensity exertion. So you want to keep it moderate or lower. Right. All right. So beta blockers first line. After that, you either need a second agent because mm-hmm. it's not controlled enough. Right. Or uh, maybe the person has this into contraindication. They will not take a beta blocker. Um, there's the next line is calcium channel blockers. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, your first thought may be diltiazem and verapamil, which is correct. Uh, but you can also use second generation dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers mm-hmm. uh, like amlodipine. Those are also allowed for uh, second line uh, angina. And so they can be used in combination, like I said, or uh, in combination or, or alone, rather, if the person can't use a beta blocker. If you are going to give amlodipine or philodipine, then uh, make sure that the patient is aware they may have some angi- or, um, peripheral edema. Right, yeah. Um, some swelling. And then in that case, uh, remember, we don't want to give a loop diuretic. Uh, you'd have to give either a different agent or a low-dose ACE inhibitor to get rid of that. Because you're dilating the precapillary bed, um, which is going to in- increase intercapillary pressure and cause the swelling of the capillaries. You're not actually retaining fluid, so a loop diuretic won't help you if it's peripheral edema caused right. from CCB. Yep. I think we talked about that a little more in detail in one of the diabetes podcasts, maybe. Probably. Yeah. So, for those of you who are like, why are they going so fast? <laughs> this is the this is the less important stuff. We'll get into what we want to focus on in a minute. But after that, um, you might consider a nitrate, and a lot of times for at least acute anginal symptoms, they'll go with a sublingual preparation, so you'll see the little amber vials of the 25 tablets of nitroglycerin that all the elderly ladies carry around in their purse with them, uh, and they'll just put one of those under their tongue if they are having pain. Uh, after five minutes, if the pain persists, they do it again, um, and if the pain persists after that, they call 911, they can take it a third time. Uh, but in that case, then they're they're having a situation where they would need to go to the hospital. Now, besides the sublingual tablets, there's also a um, translingual spray mm-hmm. and also a sublingual powder. I can't imagine the powder tastes very good, and no. I'm pretty sure the spray, the nitro mist, is pretty expensive still. I wonder so, why you would use the powder over the tablet. And can you put it in? You can't put that in like a liquid or something because it has to go into the tongue. Yeah, and I would imagine that it wouldn't have time to to mix a drink right <laughs> right mix a sports well, drink i'm having some chest pain here yeah. we go where's Pre- my orange juice like preparing your pre-workout <laughs> exactly but um yeah i don't know that there may be a great answer i'm sure there is we'll have to look that up and get back to you guys because they don't make drugs for nothing 
Well, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. If there's do. money, if there's money involved, there's a reason yeah. why they did it. But um, those are going to be used PRN. So those are not used. Right. Basically, they're not used scheduled. Those are the short acting nitrates, like like Cole said. Now there are long acting nitrates, um, and that's more of like your. Uh, nitro bidge, so which is that's your nitroglycerin ointment, which patients can apply, um, or there's like the nitroglycerin patch, um, and even like the isosorbide mononitrate, um, patients can use those as well. Mm-hmm. Um, those are more scheduled. Um, keep in mind, you want to have a nitrate free period, mm-hmm. um, usually around eight to ten hours, and you got to kind of adjust it a little bit. You don't want to uh, develop a tolerance, which is very common with nitrates. Um, Basically, if you are giving the, the patient uh, a med at 12 o'clock, you may want to give it at 10 o'clock the, the following day. Right. Um, just kind of separate it out a little bit so it's not very even every day, all day. So, um, yeah, the nitrates now, when we give a long-acting nitrate like that, that's usually because the patient has already tried first-line agents mm-hmm. and they're still not uh, able to, to – either they're not able right. to tolerate a beta blocker or the beta blocker is not getting it done maybe the calcium channel blocker, they have a contraindication to it for whatever right. reason, then uh, the long-acting nitrates would be another option. And a lot of times it's not just from exercising. People just walking around, they, they can't tolerate it. So this will uh, improve quality of life and help them with their activity activities of daily living. Right. And, and also to keep in mind, if for whatever reason you decide to use the ointment, uh, the nitroglycerin ointment, it is actually, um, there's a measuring pad in the in the package itself so if you give a patient a certain amount like uh, you know however many grams there's a little pad in there that you can put the nitroglycerin along that um that marker that uh, clear plastic dosing um, pad and then that shows them how many grams they're actually measuring out uh, please don't just tell a patient <laughs> to measure out ointment arbitrarily and rub it on their chest so is that where they put it they just put it on the chest um yeah it can like be a, on the like, chest it's like vix yeah Nani, it's nani. like it's like vix with much more <laughs> a little more much kick. more severe kick right. <laughs> yeah oh, definitely man. not which uh, not a go-to don't give your kids nitroglycerin uh ointment when they have a cold yeah you know what they will use it for sometimes though kind of off label is what? uh raynaud's Oh, really? Yeah, so if you have, like, uh, Raynaud's... Well, these on the fingers? In the hands, they'll put a little tiny bit on, like, one finger or two fingers, and mm. then kind of spread it out a little bit, um, and it'll help with, with Raynaud's. Yeah. So... I got a buddy who get, his fingers get, like, purple. He's yeah. got it pretty bad, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the problem is you still get the headaches and stuff like that from it. Oh, really? on your hands, so, so... it gets a little more systemic than just on the hands? Yeah. Um, Speaking of which, I was playing baseball with him a couple weeks ago and some other guys, and it just reminded me of how old I am. Yeah. Like, at the next two days, couldn't walk. This is baseball. This isn't basketball or football. Or anything. No. This is yeah. big poppy sport. Yeah. I couldn't walk for two days. And if you're old, was that make me? No. Well, yeah. Thanks a lot for bringing that up. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. So watch for nitrate tolerance if you're going to use long acting. Um, and then there is another agent as well. We don't see this one too often, um, but uh, Renexa. Mm-hmm. Renolazine. Um, Renolazine is another agent we can use. Um, basically going to decrease the myocardial oxygen demand. Um, still by decreasing that ventricular tension and oxygen consumption overall. So uh, one of the big warnings to watch for this is it can cause QT prolongation, and so we want to be aware of that. And also it can cause acute renal failure if a patient has a creatinine clearance less than 30. Okay, so, so it's so, renally adjusted. Yes, keep keep uh, in that in mind, and it does have some uh, CYP3A4 interactions, so we'd want to use some caution there. Um, it's supposed to not have any clinical effect on heart rate or blood pressure, so that's good. Yeah. Um, and you can use it as add-on for beta blockers uh, or to replace beta blockers if they can't tolerate them. Right. So still, though, beta blockers, first line, start low, and hopefully the patient will have adverse events, and you can keep them on the beta blocker and control the angina symptoms. Good. So uh, cool. So what if um, grandma has taken her sublingual nitroglycerin? She's in the... Ambulance on the way to the hospital, what are we doing? What's first line? So typically, um, the first thing they want you to do, if possible, is to chew two of the baby aspirin. Yes, so, uncoated. Uh, uncoated, that's super mm-hmm. important. Obviously, if we're trying to get it as quickly as possible right. into the blood, we do not want to give them enteric-coated aspirin. No. Um, the aspirin even comes as a chewable it does. tablet. So, yes. And it tastes and it's orange flavor, which is delicious. 
I'm assuming I've never tried it. <laughs> but uh, that would be a better option than just chewing some nasty aspirin. Yeah. Not that they really care at that point, but... It doesn't seem a great idea to me to make chewable aspirin orange flavored that looks like candy and call it baby aspirin. Mm-hmm. That's just like begging for you to start giving it to your kids. Uh, 100%. Yeah. Mm. Which we do not give aspirin to kids. We don't do that. People, remember? Because <clears throat> it can cause rye syndrome. It can. Stay away from it. It can. Yeah. I, I actually need... had a kid come in on my um, pediatric rotation with the rye syndrome. Really? Aspirin, yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so two aspirin. Uh, in, in, if you think about it, the, the aspirin has irreversible binding to COX-1. And so if you think about the pathway, COX-1 is going to lead to your, like, thromboxane, your vasoconstrictive properties. Um, and then also, and then COX-2, which is the other side of that puzzle, is going to lead to, like, your prostacyclin and um, some of your other dilatory uh, chemicals. And so if you block, uh, specifically COX-1 irreversibly, um, you're going to shut down that thromboxane production. So the thought is that you can get some of that uh, dilation going even before you get to the hospital. So that's what they want you to do to that, the aspirin. So at least 162 milligrams is the, the go-to. Sometimes they'll, some people will say 325. Right. Um, but yeah, 162 at least. So at least a couple of them, not just one little baby aspirin. Right. All right, so uh, yeah, like we said, um, so that's that's the first there. thing you want to do. Um, the mnemonic that's common is Mona or Mona B, which includes morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and then the aspirin. Um, the oxygen is really if you're desatting, so uh, I think less than ninety percent is when you would want to initiate oxygen. The morphine's a little controversial, right? Yeah. So the morphine, there there is some worry that the morphine can. Uh, eliminate some of the uh, absorption of the antiplatelet, which is obviously the more important aspect of the treatment. And so we wouldn't want to do anything that would cause issues with that. So if the person is not having, you know, that much pain, it would probably be better to avoid the morphine. Right, because that's just for pain. There's no mortality benefit from right. starting the morphine. So it'd probably be good to avoid that if possible. But um, it's going to be clinician specific. Um, there are definitely people that will still use it. Um, you know, the other thing is while we're kind of getting them prepped and kind of, even in the ambulance, they'll attach the 12 lead, uh, ECG to kind of go through and see what, um, what their ECG is looking like. They can forward those readings up to the, the ED that they're heading to, um, to kind of get everybody kind of on a plan of what's going to happen. So if they see that, um, ST segment eleva- elevation and they know it's a STEMI, um, they realistically have about 90 minutes. Um, from first medical contact, which, you know, the EMS uh, or, you know, whoever was first on scene, um, to getting the patient to um, a cath lab. A cath lab. So I had to have a percutaneous coronary intervention. If they're going to have a PCI. So yeah. there are other, there's PCI, there's fibrinolysis, so trying to break up the clot. There's doing neither of those. And then there's also cabbage, cabbage. would be the, the four big ones. Yeah. So we'll go back to that. But the ECGs are kind of the first thing. Um, the other thing that they can look at is cardiac enzymes to see if the person's truly having like an MI. Mm-hmm. Um, so troponins uh, are, there's I and T that are two of the ones that are released. Um, basically, those are released whenever there are myocardial cells that are dying. Mm-hmm. And so those troponins are released into the bloodstream as a result. Um, there's so it's also, pretty specific for... Yeah. for um, heart issues or MI. Yeah. Um, one of the th- measurements that's not used as frequently, but um, sometimes still used is uh, creatinine kinase myocardial isoenzyme, MKMB, or excuse me, CKMB. Um, I don't know how many hospitals use that primarily, but it is out there sometimes. Um, and then the troponins are detectable in the blood within two to 14 hours, or two, uh, excuse me, two to 12 hours, depending on the assay that's used. Yeah. So... Just a couple of the diagnostic things, but um, like Cole was saying, oxygen, if they're desatting, if uh, they need um, nitrates, there is an option for either sublingual, sometimes even IV mm-hmm. nitrates, um, possibly the morphine. Um, and then we have to decide whether or not we're actually going to undergo a PCI. Right. What's the first step in coming up with a, de- kind of making that determination? What do you, when, how long it's been, I suppose. How long? And then also... Does your facility have right. the yeah. ability to because do PCI? Patients who are um, in remote areas who aren't close to a big hospital, they might not have access to it. And even if they were air vac out, which I don't think is common at all, uh, they probably wouldn't be able to get to one of those centers in time. So, yeah, are you even able to do it? So typically about 90 minutes, like we said, is the 
is the time frame they don't want you to go above that. Um, you start to run the risk of, or you, we know that PCI has benefit, especially over things like uh, fibrinolysis, but once you get past that 90 minute window, we start losing some of that benefit mm -hmm. pretty rapidly. Yeah. So that becomes the question of whether or not we're going to continue. Um, but if it's been that 90 minute window and the person doesn't have any sort of um, other contraindications and then in the facility has a cath lab then they would probably go ahead and do a pci and that's what we're going to focus on is you're having a stimmy so this this is a stimmy this is an unstable angina or in stimmy uh, and then it's been determined you got there in the correct amount of time your facility can do it so we're going to go ahead with the pci so you've already gotten the aspirin load hopefully in the ems before you got here uh, but then they want to go ahead and get dual antiplatelet therapy on board before you go into the cath lab. So frequently they would start either Ticagrelor or Prasigro, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, well, I guess it depends on the place because some, yeah, the, the some of the hospitals will still use Clopidogrel as right. well. Right. Um, there, there's definitely some, some studies that show that depending on the situation, but typically um, we have a uh, more benefit, better <laughs> outcomes when we use uh, Prasigrel. Um, or uh, Berlinta, um, and compared to Plavex, Clopidogrel. And um, the issue of that, the other piece of that, is that you have more bleed risk with the newer agents. Right. Um, so you have to take that into account. But those antiplatelets, um, one of those three would, would typically be used. Um, let's talk to real quick, um, because I'm, I don't know how many people are familiar with what even a PCI is. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about a PCI. Yeah, I don't even think we've said the whole name yet. Yeah, I, I said it earlier. Just oh, real you? quick. Okay, good. But percutaneous coronary intervention, um, what that is, is they basically insert this, uh, and I'm going to, there's going to be, a, if a cardiologist hears this, they're going <laughs> to go crazy. <laughs> but basically what they're doing is they're, they're inserting a, like a guide wire down um, the artery. So once they know kind of like where the obstruction is, um, they send this guide wire down. And they call it a catheter because it's similar to, unfortunately, yeah. a catheter. Yeah. Um, they'll send it up to the artery and then they will send up this uh, balloon basically um, that's deflated. It'll go up through the artery. Um, to where the area is that's uh, the that's causing the blockage, um, they will inflate the balloon um, and then deflate it, inflate it, deflate it um, to kind of stretch out that artery. And then usually they will slide after it's been inflated again, it's widened up. They will slide through a, a stent, um, which is this like mesh um, tube. Um, sometimes it's a, just a regular metal mesh um, made out of metal and just, they call it bare metal stents. Mm -hmm. Um, other times they have, um, basically drug built into the stent itself. So drug eluding stent and they will send that through, um, and then where the balloon is inflated. And then after that's inserted, it will uh, deflate the balloon and remove that and leave the stent in place. And that keeps that artery open and allows for the blood flow to, to continue through. So, uh, it's therefore, pretty fascinating. Yeah, it is crazy that they can do that. And interestingly, it's not even old at all. I think the first one was done in 1977 in Switzerland, so only like 40 years ago. Uh, man, the 70s were 40 years ago. Yeah. And yeah. could you imagine getting that done in Switzerland back then? I know. Oh, wait, you're going to do what? <laughs> you're going to stick what in me and you blow what up? stick a balloon in me? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's try it. <laughs> yeah, all right, Andreas Grutznig. That was his name. <laughs> was it really? <laughs> that was his name, yeah. <laughs> Guys, I didn't just make that. I up. was gonna say, "Wow!" <laughs> no, that was the guy. Okay, I was like, that was super stereotypical and also slightly offensive, probably to somebody listening. That's his real name. Okay, never no, mind. Giving him a shout out. Uh, yeah, Forty, he, he's probably still. He might be still be alive. Who knows? He, lots more than I am. That's for yeah, sure. I would never thought to sure. do that. But um, it, so the bare metal stent versus the drug eluding stent. <laughs> um, the reason the drug eluding stent kind of came about uh, was um, basically you would get this endothelial cell regrowth um, where the stent was placed. And so the, the cells would kind of like regrow around the stent. Um, well, the drug eluding stent would kind of prolong that from happening. Um, and so, you know, the, the bare metal stent, the original stents, we would have this uh, thrombotic event. Mm -hmm. um, so you'd actually get the stent throm thrombus. Right, um, from, and, the, from what you're trying to fix the right. thrombus with, yeah. And so you get some issues with that. So they came up with drug eluding, which then would stop some of that uh, endothelial regrowth. Um, however, uh, with the, what they found out later on was that 
yes, you stop it initially, but then it actually increases your chances of having a thrombus later on. So you still have to use antiplatelet therapy. Long yes. Time. Yeah. And sometimes, in, uh, especially if the PCI is not an emergency and it's scheduled, which we'll come back to this, but uh, you actually have to treat with antiplatelet therapy longer, dual antiplatelet therapy longer. And the, um, and the drug eluting? In a drug eluting stent. So it's kind of we'll, interesting. And we'll talk about it later on, but the reason you don't have to treat forever is because it's really that metal portion that's causing the increased risk for a thrombus. And so after a while, it kind of becomes one with the endothelium, and it endothelizes, and the risk isn't really there anymore. So that's why you treat for these. We'll talk about it, but 6 to 12 months or an additional 18 to 24. We'll go through that as we go on. So yeah, so you've, you've done the PCI, uh, but you also need to anticoagulate, right? So the two uh, frequent options for anticoagulation before the PCI are either unfractionated heparin, they um, dose it weight-based, or you can use bivalirudin is another option, which is um, also renally adjusted if in a patient who has renal issues. But uh, frequently they load with um, that as well and then continue it throughout the procedure. Right, and that's just with STEMI. Yes, this is all, we're only talking STEMI with PCI. Yeah, so when you get on to like non-STEMI, they do use an oxaparin, unfractionated mm-hmm. heparin, um, fondaparin ox. So there's other options, but for STEMI, think unfractionated heparin and bivalirudin. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, if they're having PCI, because if they're not having PCI, um, then there's some other options as well. Right. But we'll talk about those. So we're, st- we're still, you know, talking the PCI route. They came in STEMI, PCI, um, they're getting their antiplatelet therapy, a loading dose. They've had their aspirin, had their oxygen maybe, maybe their morphine. They had their anticoagulation, um, PCI surgery or procedure, procedure, if you will. yeah. And uh, hopefully problem fixed. So I think it is considered a non-surgical procedure. Just they'll tell patients that to put their mind at ease because they'll yeah. frequently get some type of sedative or even a benzo beforehand to calm them down because it can be uncomfortable. They'll either stick it, um, what, in the wrist or they'll also go from uh, oral artery. Moral artery. Yeah. yeah. So that's crazy. That still blows my mind when I, I think about that. That they can get from there to the heart with a wire mm-hmm. and fix things. Yeah, yeah, that's I, awesome. With a balloon. With a balloon. I know. <laughs> Crazy. But um, I, we need to see if we can get a like a cardiac thoracic surgeon on here at yeah, some point. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be awesome. That'd be really cool. Yeah, probably could describe it a whole lot better than we can. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know about that. We have a way with words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right, so where do we want to go from here? I guess treatment therapy after that? Yeah, so that that's initial kind of leading up to the PCI. Uh, everybody's getting aspirin, um, everybody's getting P2Y12s in this case, and then what happens? Procedure's gone well, the stent's in, they didn't have a thrombus, we got to do something after that, right? Yeah, so leaving the hospital, um, typically these patients will be on aspirin indefinitely. Right, so that's the one that's going to stay on. And this is 81 milligram aspirin. Mm-hmm. Um, we're tr- treating with baby aspirin, not the 325 And in that's this important case. because, uh, with, especially with Ticagrelor, um, treating with aspirin over 100 milligrams is shown to decrease the effectiveness. We want to keep it under 100 milligrams. Yes. So um, Plato um, was the study that uh, compared the ticlinolor with clopidogrel, um, and it was superior. However, all those patients that were receiving aspirin, um, they when they kind of looked at like a subgroup analysis, a, a post hoc analysis, if you will, they they noticed that for the patients that had doses of aspirin above 100 milligrams, um, those patients kind of lost the benefits of the ticagrelor. So that's why that recommendation came about, where we don't want to go above those doses. Right. So definitely not. Plus, the bleed risk is higher with aspirin 325, and we know that the bleed risk is going to be higher right. um, compared to clopidogrel anyway right. with ticagrelor or prasugrel. So we want to make sure that... We minimize that as much as possible. Exactly. Um, so the other thing would be um, beta blockers typically mm-hmm. will be put back on. Mm-hmm. So that's um, the long, B part of the Mona B. As long as there's not... Uh, basically uh contraindication right um you know in like a fluid overload would be an instance where you wouldn't want to if they had heart failure as well or if it induced heart failure you would want to wait till they're euvolemic and stable to start the beta blocker and the beta blocker again still starting low kind of working your way up um very similarly to controlling the symptoms of just regular angina um and then obviously our statins so Mm -hmm. we would use a high intensity statin if possible um 
so if you're thinking Resuva or Atorva, mm-hmm. and with those, you don't have to start low. Just start at the highest dose. Hit and them then hard. You can work your way down from there. Um, also, Acer Arb yeah. would also be indicated as well. Yeah. And then you would even evaluate the patient for an aldosterone antagonist, so spironolactone. So a lot of, uh, unfortunately, they're leaving leaving there with a lot of different meds, mm-hmm. but uh, at least their uh, arteries are now not uh, clogged. A little better, and they're trying to prevent another one. Exactly. And, you know, their highest risk early on. So, um, And that was uh, specifically if we think about statins, and we've talked about this a lot, but, um, you know, they've compared um, a torvastatin 10 versus 80, yep. and that's specifically in patients that have already had some sort of a cardiovascular event. Yeah, that was TNT, um, right? Yeah, TNT trial, um, and the 80 was superior as far as preventing a secondary event, um, and so that's why I say just kind of jump right to the, if you're going to use a Torva, jump right to 80. Um, now, um, if you have uh, patients, if you're going to use Crestor, um, Resuvastatin, um, for instance, if you have patients that have um, are from uh, Asian descent, um, you, they do the way their body's been tabulized. Um, we do have package insert um, indication of only starting at a very low dose mm-hmm. of the resuvastatin and then working your way up. Right. So they, maybe starting around five because they equate that to about twenty milligrams um, in anybody else. So yeah. So kind of fun facts there. Yeah. Trivia. Trivia. Pharmacy trivia. Boom. All right. So. Um, you want to break down the uh, which antiplatelets to use and how we can kind of look at that. We've already talked about it a little bit. Yeah, so you start with aspirin, and then um, you're generally going to add on another P2Y12. So the most common is definitely going to be Plavix, which is clopidogrel. Uh, but you could use Ticagrelor or Prasagrel long term. Um, both of those are pretty expensive comparatively. Um, and like we mentioned, the increased risk of bleeding and the dose restrictions on aspirin, which you only need the 81 milligrams either way. So standardly, it's aspirin 75 to 100. In America, we go with 81. And then clopidogrel, 75 milligrams. Um, the, a lot of controversy revolves around how long to treat them. Uh, 6 to 12 months is pretty standard. So really, the full year is pretty standard if they're low risk for bleeding. And then after that, you really have to reevaluate the patient. You could go an additional 18 to 24 months if you've determined that their bleed risk is really low. But if they've had any issues with it throughout those 12 months or if you're concerned for it, you could just stop there. Good deal. And um, some things to kind of, if you're trying to figure out, if you have an option, basically, obviously, whatever's on formulary um, for the patient is going to be the best option. But if the patient can be on any of the three, some of the ways to kind of figure out what you want, you know, which one of those three uh, antiplatelets you want them on. Um, think if it's primary PCI, so that means they come in with a, you know, a STEMI, um, and especially in high-risk patients, so for instance, patients with diabetes, um, those patients will benefit with either prasugrel or ticagrelor over clopidogrel. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if the patient has um, basically, we're not really sure if the PCI is going to to be long-term effective, and we're thinking that um, the patient may undergo a cabbage, which is a um, another procedure where they they basically change the vasculature um, uh, in in reroute the arteries. Yeah, so that's to speak. a whole other podcast because that's um, fascinating as well. Yeah, absolutely, and they kind of reroute the blood flow basically around the occlusion and allow for the blood to go around it and redirect traffic. Mm-hmm. So if you think the patient has a high likelihood of, of a non-urgent cabbage, then uh, we would want to use ticagrelor um, in that particular patient. And then if the patient has a weight of less than 60 kilograms, um, an age of greater than or equal to 75 years, and especially if they've had a history of uh, TIA or stroke, we definitely do not want to use Prasugrel. That has the highest bleed risk, and so we want to avoid that in right. that, those patient population. Um, and then if the patient is considered to have a high bleed risk in general, um, clopidogrel would be the better option. So ticragrelor uh, or prasugrel, high-risk patients, STEMI, after PCI. Mm-hmm. And then the bleed risk, use clopidogrel. Or if the patient uh, can't afford the other two, then clopidogrel as well. Yeah. All right. So we talked about undergoing PCI. Now, what happens if the patient is not able to undergo PCI. Let's say the facility is out in the middle of nowhere. They cannot get the patient uh, to somewhere that's able to do a PCI, and uh, the patient is not able to undergo that. Mm-hmm. Um, then you have to kind of reevaluate what's going to happen. Right. Um, 
that's when the fibrinolysis comes in. Right. Um, they basically say within 120 minutes of first contact, if the PCI is not available, um, after 120 minutes, you start losing the benefit. Um, now, PCI has been compared to fibrinolysis directly, and PCI is better, better outcomes. Um, so that's why we prefer that. But if it's not available, it's not available. Um, and then in that case, same concept, we want to give um, aspirin, and then we only want to use clopidogrel because fibrinolysis is already a high bleed risk. Um, we're worried about the patient bleeding on whatever we're giving them. So um, aspirin and clopidogrel, you're starting with a loading dose of clopidogrel of 300 milligrams, um, and then the anticoagulants, um, you can still use the unfractionated heparin, or you can also use anoxaparin or fondaparinox as well. Um, and then from there, as long as that works well, you've you've destroyed the clot, broken it up, um, and the patient's being discharged, you would leave, the, the patient um, would leave on the same meds mm-hmm. they came in. Probably would keep them on clopidogrel at that point. Right. Going forward. Um, and then, like Cole said, um, there are basically some uh, things to consider as far as uh, the meds that you're being treated on, how long, typically 12 months. Um, and then if it's um, if they've been treated with medical therapy, um, you know, medical therapy alone, so just antiplatelets, then at least 12 months, um, at least, and then maybe longer. Um, if it's a uh, fibrinolysis, uh, they've been given a fibrinolytic um, agent, then at least a minimum of 14 days, um, but ideally 12 months, and you're using clopidogrel in that case, remember. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a PCI, whether it's bare metal stent or drug eluding stent, um, you're still going to do the 12 months, and then if it's a cabbage, um, after the cabbage has been done, um, you would want to uh, reinitiate the dual antiplatelet therapy for at least 12 months. Yeah, there was a smaller trial, I guess, that came out in March. It was called the Smart Date Trial, uh, and it was looking at patients post PCI, and it was comparing six months of dual antiplatelet therapy to 12 months or greater. Um, and the endpoints were relatively similar, but they did see um, less. Uh, MI in a secondary endpoint, they did see less MI long term for the patients who were treated for a minimum of 12 months. Um, so that supports the recommendation that we generally have to just go ahead and do that year unless their bleed risk is really high. Right. Um, one other thing to consider is if the patient does have stable ischemic heart disease, um, let's say they're not actually having an acute coronary syndrome, um, but you know there's this plaque buildup, you know that it needs to be removed, and you know that the patient is probably going to need a stent, um, then there can be a scheduled PCI where they're not coming in with an emergency. Right. Um, and now this is where we get the time differences. If the patient has a bare metal stent, they need to use the clopidogrel, um, antiplatelet, the dual antiplatelet therapy post PCI um, for at least a month. So one month. Um, because we're blocking it at the beginning, mm-hmm. but afterwards, after that endothelial regrowth happens, we're not really worried about it. Right. Um, and if the patient has a drug eluding stent, you'd probably want to use for at least six months. Um, and so that's kind of that's non-emergent PCI. Exactly. So scheduled, and then also there can be a scheduled cabbage as well, um, and that's still going to be twelve months um, of using a uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. Right. Um, Keep in mind, if the patient comes in or they're being scheduled for cabbage, then you would want to stop the clopidogrel um, or tetracycline for at least five days before undergoing the cabbage, seven days for prasugrel. Um, but if it was an emergency situation, um, you know, usually 24 to 48 hours would be sufficient. Right. They would undergo the procedure. Yeah. But, yeah, that is a very, very rough <laughs> breakdown of... STEMI, how to, tr- how to go through that. Um, basically, you know, depending on what your practice setting is, um, it's really just kind of important to be familiar with the procedures. Yeah, they'll have a protocol. Absolutely. For sure. And, you know, the other thing, and we'll talk to the pharmacist for a second, um, if you do have a prescription that comes through and the patient has a prescription for 300 milligrams of clopidogrel as a loading dose, don't freak out. Mm-hmm. That means that happens. they're probably uh, Or heavy. even 600. Sometimes they yeah. need to do 600 milligram loading doses. Yeah, absolutely. So that means that the patient probably has a scheduled PCI coming up, um, and so don't, uh, don't freak out. Um, the other thing to consider, if you see a patient that is on the dual antiplatelet therapy and they are also on anticoagulation long-term, mm-hmm. Um, so let's say they're on a pixaban, 
uh, Eloquus, and they're on the Ticagalore and aspirin. Um, there may be a reason for that as well. Um, triple therapy obviously puts you at very high Much risk. risk. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's a huge debate on whether or not that's appropriate. Um, but there's certain indications, such as if a patient has AFib and you know their transvas2 score is high enough to where they need to be a, um, anticoagulated long term, then they may need to be on something like Eliquis as well as the dual antiplatelet therapy short term. Yeah, and there was a, uh, a trial that came out, and I can't remember what it was called, so I'd like to go pull it, but it was basically looking at the triple therapy in patients who had had a stent and they had chronic AFib um, compared to dual therapy of just one antiplatelet and the anticoagulant. And I think they did kind of, at least in this trial, it looked like the event rate was similar between the two, but the bleed risk was higher in triple therapy. And I remember on one of my rotations, we went through it and it was um, supporting, not necessarily doing triple therapy. It was like brand new. So yeah, um, not saying you should do that, but there is data out there comparing the two and trying to figure out if it's, if it's worth the bleed risk or if it's safe to just do double therapy of anticoagulant and antiplatelet. Yeah. And, you know, speaking back to the pharmacist, the big thing is going to be if you do see this, you know, it's fine to, to question it, but I've actually seen patients where the pharmacist refused to, f- to fill their anticoagulant because they're trying to get in touch with the cardiologist. Right. And, you know, that can definitely be very dangerous as well, yeah. um, especially if it's AFib and, you know, post-PCI. Then, you know, if the patient, you know, were to have an elevated stroke risk mm-hmm. and, you know, you stop abruptly giving mm-hmm. them their, their DOAC, and that could definitely Increase the risk right there. Huge problems. Within 24 hours, yeah. So be very, very aware of that and use some clinical judgment. Yeah. Um, so it's fine to call and follow up, but absolutely. if you need to be aware that this is something that can happen, so they, they need their drugs. Yeah. They need their meds. So, and don't, you know, if they come in for their Z pack because they're having some uh, respiratory problems to your family medicine clinic, don't freak out if you see, you know, talk, give them, you know, med record and figure out what's going on, but don't. Don't just automatic, automatically freak out if you see them on three different agents. Right. All right. Um, and if you want to go look up the uh, trials on your own, like I said, the, the Plato trial was the Ticagalore versus Clopidogrel. Um, and then also the Triton Timmy 38 was Prasigrel, um versus Clopidogrel and ACS. Um, that one was going to be in the New England Journal of Medicine from 2007. And then Plato, because I don't remember off the top of my head, 2009 and also in the New England Journal of Medicine. So New England Journal gets all the fun trials. They do. <laughs> they well, do. They're a good journal. Yeah. And the DAPT trial is also a good one. It, it kind of looks at dual antiplatelet therapy past that 12-month period. And it's part of why we get the recommendation to assess bleed risk and consider another 18 to 24 months of therapy. So check that one out as well. Good deal. What else we got to talk about, man? Anything? That's all I got. I don't know. We got any updates for the, for everybody about anything? Um, updates. I'm trying to think. I don't think we have anything huge. Um, we're going to be putting up some videos on uh, Instagram for the new Instagram TV. Mm-hmm. We've got to, still got to figure that out and how we're going to work that in. Right. Um, also, too, uh, we are doing live Instagram now for all of our podcast episodes. So for those of you who... Um, like to listen to them after the fact. If you want to be in part of, a part of the podcast and like ask questions in real time, feel free. Um, yeah, we can see your questions now. We have it set up so we can actually, you know, view the questions as they come up. Um, and we will do a better job as far as letting people know when we're actually scheduling a podcast. Yeah. So. If we misspeak, like when I said that um, gout occurs in an artery instead of a joint the other day, uh, you can correct us live yeah. and we can fix it. Yeah. We can all laugh at cold together. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the, that's the next thing. And then, um, kind of going on from there, we'll just, uh, keep taking it step by step and let us know if there's anything you want us to cover and, uh, we'll keep trying to make it better. Keep trying to find new ways to, um, improve and, bring the quality and the content to next level yeah we took on another uh, acute situation a lot of times we kind of dabble in the outpatient chronic stuff but yeah. took on another inpatient hospital situation so good did it very gracefully at my dad yes absolutely <laughs> all right so we will see you guys thank you guys so much for listening please feel free to leave any comments questions concerns email us hit us up on social media and uh, we will see you next time thanks